Jane Hugh, who is a science uh, journalist, and Mitch and Greg from ASAP Science, uh, which is a YouTube and podcast uh, show that really cuts through the noise and the BS and really gets down to what you should know about specific scientific topics. We're, uh, with this webinar, very focused on understanding this moment in particular, so we do touch on themes of misinformation, health, uh, the pandemic, uh, but we also try to understand sort of the longer term trajectory of what we're going through and, uh, and reaching back into history is also an important factor in the work that we endeavor to do. So, um, I just want to point you to this Medium page where you can look up the different uh, aspects of things. And we will, I'm going to send that to all attendees in the chat right now. And so on this webpage, well, you have all of the information you need to interact with the webinar and to look up the other information about our panelists. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, for you to know how to interact with this webinar. There's no attendee audio or video available, but if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's also going to be live streamed through the WGBH forum network. And so if you are a tweeter, if you're on the Twitter world, if you've been on the, the, the bird network, you can tweet that link out and people don't need to sign up. Um, you could also post it to Facebook, uh, but who knows where that goes. It seems to be a landfill these days. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Jane is a regular contributor to Slate's Future Tense and has been recently writing about COVID-19 and investigating the bits and pieces of misinformation discarded along the way. I was very uh, smitten with her piece, No, You Did Not Get COVID-19 in the Fall of 2019, and she has multiple other articles that are uh, definitely worth checking out. And then Mitchell Moffat, which is a really great name to say. I feel like it's got that alliteration. And Gregory Brown are the co-creators of ASAP Science, a YouTube channel that produces weekly videos about science and all the accompanying weird questions and persistent rumors that come with it. And Greg and Mitch and I have been having some rolling conversations about how to cover disinformation and misinformation in this, this and other moments. And so I'm very excited to have them talk uh, to an, uh, the audience here, which tends to be academics, journalists, uh, civil society folks, and so people that may not have been familiar with their YouTube channel before. In their new video, The Truth About 5G, I highly recommend. It's really great. And um, what I really like about it is that they put the the truth and the science up front, and then they do a little bit of the dispelling of the rumors towards the end. And so it's a it's a really good complete piece, but also is a good model for thinking about communicating science. So I'm going to stop my screen share there and welcome the panelists. Um, and thank you for coming. It's a weird one to have a webinar over Zoom and <laughs> not be able to be in the same room. Normally, I would take you all out to lunch and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be able to be together on this. Um, but let me just start off by saying thank you and welcome. Uh, one of the questions that I like to ask at the beginning of these uh, conversations is really uh, about the moment, about the present. And I'm wondering, um, and maybe I'll start with you, Jane, uh, what's, what's new about what's going on in your world? Either, you know, is there an update that, you know, not necessarily, you know, what has exactly changed about your journalism, but what seems to be uh, coming through as something you hadn't had to tackle before, deal with before, that is unique to this moment? I think it's really more about how this whole situation with COVID is greater than the sum of its components. <laughs> um, I don't think any of the individual issues is new, right? Um, I think we've always had a very fast-turning news cycle 
Um, we've always had misinformation or disinformation. Um, we've always had kind of this um, difficulty trying to translate science to a general public. Um, but I feel like because all of those things are just thrown into this vacuum right now, um, it's making it harder to, to keep up with everything. Um, and I think we're really having to develop on the fly new approaches to try and write about um, these scientific advances responsibly. And that I can definitely agree with because I've I've encountered this as well, where I had to sort of reach into my bag of tricks from stuff I learned in grad school about science communication to tackle the misinformation around uh, hydroxychloroquine when that was sort of the the, the drug of the moment. Uh, and for Mitch and Greg, what's what's new? Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it is interesting, I think, specifically thinking about COVID-19, like prior to it, we were really focused on talking about the climate crisis and trying to figure out how to communicate uh, science, obviously, but like sort of, we were really focusing on that. And then when COVID-19 happened, it was at first very interesting because we saw on our channel, people. That it almost seemed like the general public was more interested in science communication. Like right when it happened, people were like, okay, we need to listen to scientists and like we saw that they were coming to channels like ours or other science communicators for information and it felt kind of like okay wow so people are curious like this we're gonna you know answer their questions and things like that but then recently what we've seen is yeah i think mirroring what you were saying jane just like so much information coming out that it's i think people are very confused they're not sure where to go we are feeling a lot of you know the, the rapid rate at which things are changing is really making us have to think like almost like what you were saying Joan going back to the beginning of like okay wait what exactly are the tactics that we're going to be using here and I think it's just the sheer amount of information now is causing people I think to get <laughs> to, to get a little loopy is how I would put it. <laughs> and I would only just add to that because we kind of work within this world like we primarily produce things on YouTube and we're within this algorithm that you know this pandemic in many ways has like not created but exposed a lot of the weaknesses to algorithms which riot off of extreme content that can aggravate or excite or make you feel afraid and so as science communicators trying to navigate that in a way that's respectable but also reaching people as you said Jane like there's like this interplay of being inside a system that obviously YouTube's having to deal with as well and we saw you know a week or two ago that pandemic video kind of blow up and certain things that have been getting passed around related to coronavirus and 5g and all these things so there's just so much being said that it feels <laughs> like and we're all at home able to consume 24 hours a day so it's wild yeah, I, I, I hear you. When I talk to reporters about this, I often say um, there's this adage from science and technology studies that a lot of us employ where we say more is different, right? So it's not just a question of scale and overabundance, but that it actually changes a lot about the information environment when you have more information, both good and evil, uh, for many different purposes. And and in thinking through this, talking to some people at platform companies, they too seem completely overwhelmed by the attention to one sphere of information. Whereas, you know, we live in a, a polyvocal society, many, many voices and many, many issues, many ideas. But for right now, it seems like the globe is focused on this one issue and everything else as it relates to that issue becomes relevant, but, uh, but COVID-19 is definitely, uh, it both reached, uh, you know, in terms of its, its capacity as a disease, uh, the level of pandemic, and then the WHO describes this other factor of the infodemic, which is this overabundance of true and false information. Um, so that's, obviously hard to keep up with, right? And I want to know a little bit about how you all decide what to cover then in this moment. Where do you start? Is it something like, you know, your readers or your viewers jump in and say, hey, we want to know about this and you wait for a critical mass? Or is it something where uh, you see something 
that's percolating and you're just like, maybe this is a story. Jane, like what's, what's inspiring you and how are you thinking about what to cover and what not to cover? I feel like if there's one thing about COVID that's different than my usual coverage, it's that for me, it's clear what I should be covering. Um, usually, you know, there's, and as news has become focused on only COVID stuff, um, I'm finding myself wanting to write about things that I have questions about or things that people in my life have clearly had questions about. Um, and I feel like just scrolling around online, honestly, like on social media, seeing what misinformation is being shared um, or just what misconceptions people might have or what new research is coming out. Those are really helpful things uh, to keep an eye on for me to get story ideas. Um, but yeah, I feel like in the before times, it was always like, you know, you could cover an infinite number of topics. But now that we've kind of focused down on so many COVID related issues only, um, it's easy to take inspiration from just what I'm wondering. Great. I would say for us, it, it was a little more simple at the beginning as, you know, quarantine sort of happened. There were a lot of very similar questions amongst all of our sort of followers and people we wanted to be able to, you know, talk about uh, viruses and vaccines. And a lot of what we try to do often is, okay, how do you use a cultural moment to explain any element of science or biology or, you know, like that's kind of where we come from with things. But I'd say as it's gone on, it's maybe become a little more confusing because at the beginning we were like, okay, this is a great opportunity to talk about vaccines and viruses and what a pandemic means. And these kind of broader concepts that, you know, you would want the general public to know. But now as we see the, the conversations shift to whether it be controversies or misinformation or conspiracies and crazy stories it's a little sometimes it's exhausting because you're like oh, like to be some like merged in this all the time can also take a toll on you because you're like oh, going down the rabbit hole myself is kind of exhausting yeah we released a video about teeth the other week <laughs> <laughs> didn't do very well which is interesting <laughs> but but I, I think it's interesting that you said that Jane because I was curious what you were going to say but it, it actually comes a lot from our friends and family <laughs> and our actual community and what they're at, like what they ask us so early on our vaccine video was because we had a couple of friends who were, you know, really excited to see us like, well, in a couple of weeks when we get a vaccine, like then I'm so excited to hang out. And we were like, <laughs> oh, honey, like, <laughs> but, you know, we didn't realize that like it, you, you can actually mine quite a bit of important information by keeping it within your friends and family, at least for what we do, because we hang out with a wide variety of types of people. But now that we're at this point, I would say it, it has become more challenging because there is an abundance of things happening at all times. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, Greg and Mitch, where, what inspired your show or what, you know, because to be honest with you, I, I'm sort of known for taking some, basically putting a hit out on YouTube and <laughs> letting them know that it's become a cesspool of some pretty dangerous information in terms of the way in which they allowed networks of white nationalists to populate and raise money and, and recruit people. You know, I don't blame you for that, <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, it's a platform with many millions of users worldwide. Of course, nobody's responsible for anybody else's content. Um, but with your show, obviously you're one of the gems on YouTube of things that, you know, when I am in my most angry of moments thinking like let's just let's just move to Maine get a little cottage never hook it up to the internet but then I'm like oh but you know there are a few good things out there and especially the kind of work that you do so what inspired the show what's a bit of the history of the show and and what were the main motives behind starting with with doing a YouTube channel well, that means a lot, honestly. Thank you. That really means a lot to us. Um, we should probably we hate we also are very angry at YouTube all the time that we're just gonna <laughs> hang on to what you just said. Um, yeah. So to start, we started this channel like eight years ago. Um, I was becoming a science teacher, like in the classroom. Mitch was working in a lab, and we like one of the main reasons was you leave university and all of a sudden you're not forced to learn anymore. That freaked us out. It was like a little bit of a way of creating like projects for ourselves so that we kept up to date with science. Slash I was in a classroom talking to kids who were all coming in to my classes with amazing information from YouTube. 
So at the time I was like, wow, YouTube, positivity, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> science communication. Like that's what, <laughs> what I thought it was. Um, yeah, I would definitely say things have transformed over the years. More. The conversations even among, like in the first two, three years of the, stu- of the work we were doing and the people we were meeting and other science communicators and not just YouTube, but Facebook groups and stuff. There's a lot of positivity around, you know, this information age. We're getting to educate people literally everywhere in the world. And our videos have been seen in every country that has access to YouTube. Think of how amazing this is going to be. And we were all kind of blind to the kind of negative aspects that were maybe yet to come. And so <laughs> as much as you're feeling that, I feel that we, and I'm sure our, our fellow creators on online feel that same way. And that sort of, oh gosh, like, the capacity for this to also spread misinformation at a much higher rate at a rate that means someone doesn't have to have any knowledge or expertise they can put up a video way faster than we ever could because they don't have to fact check themselves and now suddenly they're at the top of the search or the top of the algorithm because they've got the name or the the title for it became kind of daunting to us and i do know like obviously youtube's tried to address these things over the years but it's been a challenge and it's been frustrating for us as well because there's a lot of conversations around, you know, their algorithm and like no one can take personal responsibility for it because it's no one, technically it's just some robot that's making all these decisions. And I don't know, it's been, obviously there's a corner of our YouTube bubble that's inspiring and great. And we see other creators that like inspire us and make us feel so good. But when you think of the mass scale of it and how it is not, um, not that it needs to be fully monitored, but we don't even know what's out there. And then you hear it bubble. To yeah, the surface. you kind of nailed it, though. We really started this to teach science and thought it was an amazing platform to do it. And now we continue to do it to try and sift through the bullshit and try and keep something on this platform that is going to help combat your right. The things that it really has done negatively in the last mm. five, six years. That's great. Thank you for you know, agreeing with me because <laughs> you never know. I mean, uh, you know, the thing about YouTube, I think in its promise uh, when it got started was this, I mean, obviously the first, not everybody knows this, but the first version of YouTube was a dating site. YouTube, the idea was basically you'd put up a video of you and it would replace that VHS, you know, video dating where you could then be like, okay, I want to date, you know, guy or gal number five six seven one one right and so the idea was you could speed up that process with these very short videos and then over time it became a repository for nearly everything existing and um and now i think they're trying to figure out what their curation strategy is going to be going forward and that forces misinformation into other spaces online um perhaps a topic for another day. Jane, I wanted to ask you about the uh, piece you published in Slate on uh, the viral studies uh, section of Slate about the mutant coronavirus study. Do you want to talk a bit about what led you to look at this, what the piece was about? And, um, you know, we're interested really to hear about how reporting on preprints might um, become a challenge for other reporters in the in the near future. Definitely. Yeah, I feel like reporting on preprints has always been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge, especially as we are moving at warp speed, um, trying to get new information about coronavirus. Um, so I guess for folks who um, aren't familiar with this, and if you blinked, you may, may have missed it because I feel like the news cycle is moving so fast. Um, there was a preprint out about um, mutations in the coronavirus genome. Um, and this preprint had identified that there was one mutation that had become really popular. Um, that mutation had spread through Europe and also through kind of the east coast of the US in largely in February and early March, I think. Um, and the preprint authors concluded that this might have some implications for vaccines um, and also that it's possible that that mutation became popular because it was in some way more transmissible. Um, And so what happened was that the LA Times covered this and they pretty much just interviewed the um, authors of the paper and ran with the conclusions that those authors put forth. Um, I think they interviewed one outside source. Um, That person manages labs and has 
done some coronavirus testing but has no particular expertise in like genome sciences or virology or epidemiology, which are kind of the specialties you would want to be looking for experts in um, so that they could actually remark on kind of the nuts and bolts of the paper. Um, and so when that piece came out, um, at that point, scientists had been on Twitter talking about the preprint for a while and had been kind of doing an almost informal peer review type of thing um, since that paper had not yet actually been submitted to a journal. Um, and so scientists, when that LA Times piece came out, were, uh, I guess, to put it mildly livid. <laughs> um, a lot of people were concerned about um, just kind of propagating the, the author's conclusions on it. Um, and I think it was just the case in which it was a hard call. I think that that journalist was probably under, under a fast deadline. Um, I actually spoke with him. Um, I think he's a generally like a national reporter um, and found this piece interesting um, because the study seemed to have interesting implications. But I think for me, what this really highlighted was the struggle of covering preprints, right? Um, and how necessary it is to try and get as many outside sources to comment on this as possible. I mean, in fact, a few science journalists had mentioned that when that preprint first came out, they actually had reached out to a few sources and those sources had said, you know, I would maybe hold off on this for these reasons. Um, we need to know more. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's hard. Um, people are really trying the best that they can, but there are still times where I think people make calls that not everyone would make. We just have differences of opinion about how to cover these things. Yeah, and for Mitch and Greg, when you're sourcing your scientific information and putting together your, you know, videos or your little lab reports, <laughs> you know, putting together your lab reports, um, where are you getting your information? Because I think that there is this big tension. We know science takes a long time. Academic journals are slow to the punch. Computer science has tried to fix this by having conferences be the main venue in which they publish papers and that has has greatly accelerated their field in terms of keeping information flows vibrant but when it comes to things like studying a vaccine or you know it might take years for us to get where we're going and so I'm interested to hear what is the mix that you all try to consider when you're reporting on the things that are new and novel versus things that have kind of had that peer review process and have gone through, um, you know, a, a bit of vetting. Yeah. So, um, for the most part, if you think, if you think outside of our COVID-19, uh, videos, you kind of nailed it. It really does feel like we are doing a science project every week and that we go, we go through a wide variety of peer reviewed, uh, articles from different, a wide variety of different journals, which is a lot easier when you're talking about something more general, like what is a hangover? Like <laughs> we, we understand those biological processes much more deeply and we can get into really cool information. One thing bouncing off of that, that we like to do in our videos is visually explain the studies. So we actually show what happened in a specific study. For example, a lot of the time it's two mice or something like that you know, we'll draw the mice, we'll show what happened, we'll show the result. So we're not actually ever saying, which can happen a lot of the time with pop science, especially headlines, things like that. They say something that some sort of like really elaborate claim. Then when you actually look at the study, you realize, oh, okay, there's a lot of different variables there. So one thing we luckily get to do, because a lot of what we do with animate plus talk, when we animate, we can actually kind of show the exact study, which might be a lot harder when you're actually say writing an article or something, that's an advantage of the visual medium. But with our COVID-19 videos, a lot of them are based on, for example, the vaccine video, we actually explain what goes into making a vaccine, not the COVID-19 vaccine. Like we're actually talking about the process of making vaccines so we can actually go into the past and have a lot more information. And the real thesis of that video was just that it's going to take a long time because of how these trials work. So sometimes when you look uh, especially back to the YouTube algorithm at the titles of our videos, you think you're going to get this answer that's going to explain what's happening right now. But really what we're trying to do is sort of create like a literacy around science so that people can understand that it's a lot more nuanced than you think. And a lot of the time we, we get a lot of reflection at when people end our videos, they're like, oh, it sort of makes them feel a little bit less wound up maybe, which again is not necessarily like 
the most viral concept for YouTube videos, but it really is trying to explain the process. But with hydroxychloroquine, for example, that was talking about the studies being like, okay, there's this French study with this many people who got it. This is how many people recovered. Things like that. We're just explaining the studies. We're not ever actually telling you what you should think. You can look at that information and gather what you want from it. And a lot of the time what you're gathering is that it's too early for something like that to really have a strong opinion on. Yeah. And I, I think one of the frustrations that many of us have is how uncertain scientists are when, so, you know, there, people often ask me, you know, they'll be like, well, why don't scientists just come out and tell you what they really mean? Or why don't they tell you what their, you know, what their study means and why aren't they tweeting? And, you know, and I'm just like, I, if you met scientists, like they are, they are drilled down kind of people. And that's what we have to appreciate about the way in which some scientists can spend, you know, many decades on the same question and find new ways of exploring it, new methods, invent new machines, new measurements, you know, and so, uh, so there's many ways in which I think we would want scientists to communicate to the public, but in doing so, it's almost as if it's another job entirely, and that scientists do need to rely on communicators like journalists or like you know people who make uh and explain popular science uh, because without that translational mechanism right we're adding another burden onto the the sort of everyday uh audience or viewer who who may not understand some of the technical terms but really do have an earnest interest um some of the Recent research that I think came out in Nature this week is looking at, uh, prior to this moment, but looking at some of the historical data on how anti-vaccine movements utilize the Facebook um, group structures and how they reach out to the uncertain, right? So finding people that are exploring questions, not necessarily looking for definitive answers or haven't made up their minds, you know, and I'm not sure everybody needs to make up their mind about, you know, if what the first line treatment for COVID-19 should be at this stage, right? We should be exploring a lot of options. Scientists, journalists too, should be critiquing and digging deeper into finding out what are the special interests involved. Uh, and so what I'm interested in thinking about with this, this tension right now between getting you know, complete up-to-date information that feels certain, which is intention with science itself, which is exploring uncertainties at its base and then trying to sort of like inch by inch put, you know, put us one step closer. Um, has there been anything that you've discovered along the way in, in, navigating COVID-19 that has changed your thinking about either reporting on science or, uh, you know, the way in which you communicate science to the public, uh, including if you want to get into it now around how do you deal with misinformation in this moment, given that we do have quite a bit of uncertainty as well. And uh, either one of you can pop in. I don't, I don't want to keep putting Jane on first if she doesn't like to be. Mm -hmm. I think my first thought that came out of that was, I think I have been more mindful than ever that getting news out there or reporting what is the latest is not necessarily the best thing to be doing right now. Um, I've actually taken a couple of weeks where I've just been a little bit slower to write because as everything's churning, I feel like I need more time to make sense of what it means rather than just getting that information out there and thinking about how it fits into the world in general instead of just being like, here's this new piece of information. Um, because like you mentioned, I think people are really inundated with information right now. And I would rather write something that has a little more staying power um, and that has maybe some long-term lessons or big picture ideas that we might take from it rather than just getting the information out there. And I do think that there's room for, um, you know, that really quick reporting as well. But um, in the last few weeks, I've just seen so many times that that's backfired, um, that I feel like I'm being a little bit more cautious about what I want to put out there. 
I would say for us, one thing, I think part of our mission has always been to capitalize on interest for science and then use it to talk. So, you know, whether we're talking about how coffee affects you or alcohol or sleep, capitalizing on that interest at the personal level and then explaining the science behind it. And so I think what has changed now is we're still taking a moment to capitalize on the conversations that are happening because people are searching like, what is a pandemic and how long until the vaccine, but then really infusing that message of not just uncertainty, but explaining how science works, explaining that this one study is really interesting maybe, but it doesn't necessarily paint a full picture and that we can all calm down, like don't let one article or one video or one message from a friend freak you out and make you scared. Take a moment to step back, allow things to catch up, allow everyone to have that conversation around it so that we can have a full view of it. Because for the most part, like, I mean, not at all, we're not in the lab. We aren't scientists, we're science communicators. And so even you shouldn't just trust our opinion. So the hope is that we can communicate like, hey, let's step back. Science is a process, like you said, inch by inch, thousands of studies upon thousands of studies. And most scientists will agree that their one paper can often be taken out of context and used for either purpose on either side of the political spectrum. So for people to just learn that lesson, I think now is a good time to kind of capitalize on this moment to teach that lesson. It's very nuanced, it's very complicated. There really is no simple black and white. Let's kind of wait till we have more information. And in the meantime, just be interested that the studies are interesting in and of themselves. It's a good point. And, you, you know, you're scratching on, you know, where, where I think we need to go in this conversation about the politicization of science. So one of the things that um, colleagues and I were really concerned about when uh, the president started endorsing specific treatments over others, as we know that political influence can really uh, accelerate uh, some treatments and at the cost of exploring others, right? We Resources are not infinite, neither is attention. And so when politicians start to make, uh, uh, start to do advocacy around treatments and around disease, what we would call a disease constituency or, you know, groups of people that are, need access. Um, we have to pay attention to, to what the frame is and what it might be doing politically also to, you know, enhance their reputations, for instance. And so what happened after the president uh, it really started to talk about hydroxychloroquine and, and zinc and, um, and zithromycin is that there was like a run on the pharmacies and people were seeking this out and were stockpiling it. The U.S. bought a, a bunch of hydroxychloroquine to stockpile it. And now the studies are starting to come back saying, that it might not be uh, the game changer or the frontline treatment that it was. And if you go back and you look at discourse about potential treatments, hydroxychloroquine was a, cl a close front runner, but it wasn't as uh, talked about online as rendesivir, which is now right now the le leading in studies as something that can help treat coronavirus, certainly not a cure. Um, but in the process of politicizing the, dr the drugs, we saw quite a bit of polarization around science. It's, it felt like if you were to say just what you said, like, let's wait and see, you know, let's look at the studies, let's not make hard and fast determinations, um, you sounded like you, you almost sounded like you were pro pandemic right like we're like let's just let's just hang out and not pay any attention and right and and but on the other side it, at least there was this commitment to a treatment whether it worked or it didn't it was you know advisable that everybody try it and i felt really um pulled in a couple of different directions as someone who was writing about this to be able to communicate that i like everybody else, want a cure as fast as possible. But I also don't want the public to harm themselves in the process by, you know, taking drugs that are either prescribed and not monitored or, 
uh, you know, and we also got reports from from folks on the front lines that hospitals were being called by family members advocating that their family members who are sick get access to these drugs. Uh, and it really did tilt the fields of science in in a in a negative way. It pitted Trump against Fauci uh, in a in a way too. And I'm I'm wondering about what were your struggles in reporting on and thinking about this, um, Greg and Mitch, as you as you explored it in your video. Yeah, I mean, I think you sort of nailed it about what the issues are when the president says something like that. Like, I think it was quite obvious to us that the president of the United States at that point was not the person who should be saying that. Like that made sense to us, uh, like regardless of where we were at in the political spectrum, it's like, it, it's not appropriate for that exact reason, some of those anecdotes you mentioned. But I think that it's kind of interesting. I, I don't think we ever, I never really thought about how the message of the video was that there needs to be more time. Like that is, interesting. We definitely talked about that and said that. We never really were like saying that hydroxychloroquine was bad or it wasn't right, but we were saying that definitely the way that the studies were at the moment, there needed to be more time to have a scientific consensus. And um, yeah, so I think that that's fascinating. One thing, scientific consensus, those two words are something we've really been thinking about a lot right now, which is that that really is uh, something that does take time, having a, sci a scientific consensus on something takes time and it's also where I think we like to be when we make our videos being where is the scientific consensus on this subject um but I, I don't know I, I don't know if you thought about that with the hydroxychloroquine video I didn't really think that much about how saying that we need time could make people feel you know that like, like we were yeah pro -pandemic. <laughs> well I think it's just um the... I, mean, I mean I'm being a bit silly but right. no, no, but, know, I, but I mean, it does it does really sound you know it almost sounds like you know you're saying right. I'm fine right. I so, can wait like, you know yeah like everybody no, I, else I'm just saying it's like interesting yeah. I guess well, I mean, it, it's it's because I watch a lot of conspiracy videos, right? <laughs> so I get the other side of the conversation, which is like, you know, they're tr they, you know, and whoever your construction of they is, right? They are trying to prevent us from having this, right? Rather than saying science takes time, let's mm. let's not jump the gun here. But at yeah. the same time, but we were also trying to say that like you need your your medical professional and your doctor to be telling you these things because of the complexity, what we were trying to show is that when you take a drug, how complex your cells are, it's never just going right to the coronavirus and being like, what's up, buddy? Pew, 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 pew. Like mm -hmm. it's affecting all parts of your cell. So mm -hmm. the part we were trying to say is that like, this might actually be a really bad drug depending on the other symptoms that you might have or the prior diseases you might have, which I think, you know, when heard might be like, oh, they actually aren't, they are trying to figure out how to make this safe. But yeah, definitely no. like the path by which to if hydro if hydroxychloroquine is or was or will be the best drug. I mean, certainly the president tweeting it to the public isn't the way to effectively uh, produce and transmit or d administer to people, right? So it just it, it's a frustrating thing to have to deal with because it's like you want to have that conversation say, yes, this actually might, we don't know yet, this might be the real drug, but like, this isn't how we go about getting it to people and making sure it's safe and approved and producing it at mass quantities. Like people going to their pharmacies and begging their doctors for this thing or looking for household items that have this drug already in it are obvious consequences of just spouting out that this is the cure, you know, or our most likely cure. So I just think it's, yeah, I, I can understand that perspective and there are lots of people who are probably suffering and we're like desperate for something, but um, it's for us, it's like, okay, yes, that might be the answer. How do we, how does a government construct an effective plan? And that can be said about testing and that can be said about any of the solutions that have come up. The public doesn't, they have a big stake in it, but they don't know, we don't know the answer. None of us, like collectively, we have to have our scientists and engineers and mathematicians and medical professionals come together and say, this is the plan of attack and we will now execute on it, so. I think one thing that you all mentioned about census and then also about all of these different um, stakeholder groups and expertise, groups of expertise here, I think that makes it all the harder for people to wade through who to trust right now, right? I think usually you feel like you can trust, or I guess it really depends on <laughs> your personal beliefs. Um, 
people have a wide ranging uh, set of opinions about whether you can trust the government. Um, but people, I think, also think of scientists or doctors or medical professionals as this kind of like monolithic group. Um, and it's difficult right now because there's so many different opinions out there right now. And also even people who are like in science doing, working on all of the same things are having a lot of these debates publicly right now because that's you know the only way we can really gather um, is online. So I think people read that as uh, kind of disconcerting if you don't know the context of the process of science, which I think makes it all the more important to try and communicate that. Um, I think a lot of people who you know have worked in science or spend a lot of time um, reporting on science um, are familiar with things like the peer review process and the uncertainty um, and all of the wild back and forth um, that happens during peer review. And if you don't have that context, I think it is probably more confusing to try and figure out where people are on this. So. And I think, yeah, one of the tensions too is probably around how quick and easy it is to access information right now. And, um, but that's counterposed with producing knowledge, which is you can access information, you can produce information, but producing knowledge is very expensive. It's very painstaking. It takes a long time um, and it has to be exact, which means it has to be read and reread and redone. Uh, and, and that um, is obviously in tension with the kind of world that we live in, which is this sort of instant information sphere where pretty much everything you search for, you will find something on it, uh, whether it's true or not. Jane, I want to get into your piece a bit um, because you mentioned expertise here, the piece on herd immunity uh, this was something that had come about into my world where uh, I was cooking dinner for my spouse one night and I was watching um, Inside Edition, which if you're not familiar with it, don't familiarize yourself with it. But it's one of those shows that's competing with like Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy, you know, for the seven o'clock entertainment news type hour. Um, and they just you know, put up on the screen that, you know, Stanford researcher says you probably have been exposed to COVID-19 if you lived in California this fall. And they did a little piece on this, this researcher and this idea that people have herd immunity. And they did a few interviews where people were saying, yeah, I was sicker than a, any, a, sicker than I've ever been in November. And I, I don't know what happened, but maybe I have herd immunity now. And but the piece you did really challenged experts on staying in their lane. And the, the expert that was attesting to this herd immunity was not exactly someone who would know. And do you want to explain a little bit about the story and, and the, the way in which affiliations and expertise uh, with universities can sometimes become a placeholder for believability? Yes, absolutely. Um, I actually came across that idea, the this whole herd immunity or whether you might have had COVID in the fall of 2019. Um, similarly, like through just a Facebook group that I'm in, a lot of people were talking about it. I think it really struck this chord with people anecdotally because a lot of people like may have gotten really sick in the fall. And um, I think at that point we were all hoping that if you had it, then maybe you have immunity. Um, but yeah, so that piece, um, I ended up clicking on this news article um, and it mentioned this research that was happening um, at Stanford Medicine. It was um, an antibody test that they were doing. That study has actually since been um, widely criticized for its methods, but I won't get too much into that. Um, but then accompanying this news of the fact that this antibody test was happening, um, was a theory from um, a Stanford researcher um, who turns out to be a historian, not a doctor or a scientist. Um, and the theory was that uh, perhaps we would have herd immunity in California if the, um, the virus had spread in the fall. Um, and the way that the piece read was really misleading. Um, and I think a lot of people had independently uh, investigated this, I guess. Um, I'd actually seen like a Facebook thread in which 
someone else after my piece came out had actually been following that whole story for days um, as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just by saying Stanford researcher, I think a lot of people were like, oh, so the study's happening at Stanford Medicine. It sounds like these doctors think that we have herd immunity. Um, but really it's a theory put forth by this historian. I do, I'm actually, I've seen those same researchers um, not necessarily advocating for herd immunity, but they still are standing by the results in a way that um, suggests that they are convinced that we there is more, um, there are more people who have had the virus than um, you might expect. But still, I think that in the particular case of that piece, I think um, that person's affiliation with Stanford um, really kind of elevated them to seeming like an expert on an issue that they, that's not their research expertise at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that makes sense. And uh, one of the things that had really got me interested in the hydroxychloroquine example was uh, another person using a Stanford affiliation when they were on uh, a Fox News show saying that it's the, you know, 100% cure for coronavirus. And uh, but when you are an academic and you see affiliations, there's different ways that you read them. You know, if it says professor of history <laughs> at Stanford, that's different than saying Stanford researcher. Um, and so, yeah, from my perspective, uh, the affiliations and the ways in which people come to be associated with universities sometimes can present or read to journalists and others as having expertise in a certain area um, when, of course, that is not uh, the case. And it, But what's hard, I think, from academics perspective is some of the work that we do is so esoteric and nobody cares about it anyway, that if someone calls and they're like, you want to talk about this other thing? Some people will be like, yeah, I could talk about that. I mean... <laughs> I'm a human being, right? I have good opinions. Um, but yeah, it gets difficult when we're in this, you know, rolling sort of like, I, I kind of picture it like, you know, or just kind of tumbling downhill, like with the misinformation around COVID-19. And we're really trying to figure out how do we stop that, right? How do we get into a mode where we're not constantly trying to catch up and and, and uh, get at the misinformation when it's already gotten out there and harmed so many people. And we wrote our, um, our Me More weekly newsletter this week about uh, dystopic futures. And so there's this meme that's uh, fully automated luxury gay space communism, which is something that people circulate. It's really funny. And it's this like, kitschy kind of idea that like, you know, what the left really wants is cats eating pizza hanging with dogs and everything's, you know, everybody loves everyone, et cetera. And it's, you know, it's kind of jokey, but then when you get into the kind of dystopias that exist around the pandemic, we get this video, the pandemic, uh, that was circulating last week. And in the video, there's a discredited scientist who's advocating for, uh, you know, suggesting that people shouldn't be wearing masks, suggesting that the vaccine and other interventions are going to be uh, scientifically unreliable. The video is very well done. The production value is very good. Uh, they don't leave you with a lot of other places to go. You know, it's, it's really got a nice flow to it in the sense that it's a good narrative box and you feel like you've learned a lot and you don't need to, to go anywhere else. But what struck me about the way that video is distributed as a kind of scientific communication is that they had a website where what they did was they put a direct download link to the video and said, this is going to get taken off of platforms. You know, big tech wants to silence us and our science isn't going to be listened to. So download this and then di distribute it everywhere. So that what they were trying to do was mobilize audiences to just re-upload it to their their own YouTube channel or their own Facebook or their, you know, put it on, um, and, uh, you know, BitChute or any of the other um, video, video uh, archiving places as a, as a way to participate in some respect in scientific communication and making sure that this 
video and this it went on beyond the uh, the moment um, of deletion because they knew the video violated YouTube's terms of service, right? And so they used that as a media manipulation tactic and then got coverage in all of the mainstream press. And we can't rely on that for people like you all. <laughs> you know, we can't say, well, we're going to make this wildly outrageous and wrong video and then mobilize our audiences to distribute it as an act of sort of, you know, information warfare and then uh, use that as a way to propel our ideas into, into uh, new audiences. And so uh, as we wrap up here, I wanna think a little bit uh, less dystopically, but a little bit about the future of scientific communication. And you know, I wanna hear from both of you or all three of you, what, um, what's coming down the pike for you? What, what are things that you're excited to report on? stories that you think need to be told and you know where do we go from here knowing that the tactics of people who are anti-science uh they're plentiful and they're really well suited to getting attention uh and you know where do where are you all thinking you're gonna go in your work i'm not asking you to solve this problem obviously <laughs> i'm not like well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit that flag button on that video later today, right? No, I'm asking sort of like in your sphere of influence, you know, what, what, are, what are you going to do in the next couple of weeks that we should be paying attention to? I, I just wanted to quickly make a comment about what the thing you were just talking about where like pandemic as an example used that fear tactic of like we're getting taken down because it reminds me in a lot of ways of a tactic in which a handful of large YouTube creators, and I'm not going to name names, have pitted themselves as like the antithesis of the system and that they've been oppressed, even though they are some of the biggest creators on the platform. And that has actually helped propel them into larger bouts of fame. Mostly all dudes. Uh, yeah, all the ones I'm thinking <laughs> <Always>. of. <laughs> but it's just an interesting tactic. Like that's not a, cons I mean, I guess in some ways it's their own conspiracy theory, but it's to their own end. And I think we maybe need to think more about that tactic. Like I haven't really thought a lot about it, but how how successful it is to say, we are victims right now, we're being victimized. And we see all sorts of people do this who are multimillionaires or billionaires say that they're the victims. Maybe even the president of the United States plays a victim against conspiracies. And so I just think like now I'm, I'm really interested in like how do people combat that without slipping into doing that themselves? Um, this is one of those things that Mitch and I will sometimes cry over a bottle of wine about. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't. Know. It's Friday, so maybe tonight. <laughs> yeah, like we definitely would love to be like, here's our answer. But it really, like, I really feel like this pandemic is unprecedented. <laughs> People say that quite a bit, and I really think that there is a way in which we leave this net positive or we leave this net negative and what you're describing and that exactly what you're saying, this like way that people are trying to like manipulate it is really frustrating to me because I really think there is a way that this could actually uh, do something much more positive. I think you're right. Mitch and I work very well as a team because Mitch is, I feel like you're really good at thinking about those things. Whereas sometimes I just want to be like, we're making the hydroxychloroquine video because Donald Trump is wrong. You know what I mean? And he goes, <laughs> he's like, has a more balanced, approach he's like well what if he's he, what if he is right so like we come together that but personally i think that i want to start talking about like a just transition out of this i think as someone who as we were trying to talk about the climate crisis before i think this can be a really interesting opportunity to talk about um uh, building a new grid structure like actually realizing like how important it is to like use renewable energy in the future how we stop another pandemic uh, pandemic and <laughs> pandemic. Wow, what a good title. Um, so those it's are like medic. More... That's the yeah. that's the point. I know. Like personally, I would love to. Like, I really want to focus on yeah a just transition out of this that nets positives for uh, the earth and for the climate crisis. Uh, but I think you're right. There's a lot of those tactics being used, or maybe things we have to think about how we. I don't know if use them is the right term, but I mean not completely be unaware of the fact that this playing victim type energy I think is facing really it. Like powerful. the only thing I'll add on to it is just facing that, that power or that, that tactic that people use. I've seen some successful creators online fight, you know, 
conspiracies or the alt-right by not being afraid to address those things and really saying like I, I know it's exhausting for us to do the work even as like queer people you're like I don't want to have to explain to you why you have to like fight for the rights of me to exist in this world right but then sometimes it's like but okay fine I'm gonna do it because otherwise <laughs> who is gonna do this for me so I mean ideally starting there fighting it and then building our networks of people who can also fight with us and finding our allies whether it's related to social issues whether it's related to scientific issues you know how do scientists band together with science communicators with allies in the public spaces to go forward and make sure that there's like herd immunity in science literacy. <laughs> That's awesome. Jane? So one thing that you mentioned that really struck a chord with me was um, talking about specifically um, the messaging behind pandemic, right? Like, you know, big tech is going to censor us and this is now forbidden fruit. And I feel like that all of the folks that I've seen talking about pandemic in my life, um, I've seen the reason why it's resonating with them is because it hits on some very real anxieties. And I think that those are anxieties that a lot of us share, um, whether or not we you know, believe what people in the pandemic video said. Um, but I feel like that is an opportunity for us to try and think about what kernel of truths there are in this misinformation and why it is that it's appealing to people and I don't quite know how to get ahead of that, but I do think that that's one reason why reporting and science communication need to include this critical context, right? Like, I feel like um, a lot of the time scientists and science communicators and journalists try and maintain this air of objectivity by not talking about the politics or the, the wider implications of work. And I, I feel like that's at a certain point doing readers a disservice. I do think it's important to be balanced and fair, um, but I think completely avoiding these conversations about politics or the broader context in which all of this is happening is not going to do much for us, especially in terms of combating misinformation. Um, yeah, and I feel like just in, our, in my personal life, um, apart from my work, just trying to talk to as many people as I can about what I'm doing, what I'm learning, um, and trying to connect with people on those shared anxieties has been a lot more effective than what I really want to do sometimes, which is just rant um, and, and spew information. I feel like also that's another thing that um, sometimes people have this kind of information deficit model of science communication, right? Where you're like, if only people had the information, then they would understand and it would be fine. Um, but I really feel like we're, that's not it right now, right? Like there's so many emotions and anxieties playing into this that we also need to think about that as we're crafting messages and thinking about what our greater point is going to be to the public. Um, it's not just a matter of getting the facts out there. I appreciate that. Well, we are at the end of the hour and it's been awesome. I have learned too much and I am going to revisit scientific consensus in this moment. And Jane, I think I'm, I'm right there with you that we are not in an information deficit model anymore. We are in information overload and that requires a curation strategy. We need to be more upfront with how do we, you know, use and use the knowledge of librarians about how they, you know, put the books on the shelves to rethink how platforms shelf all of the needed information that people have in this moment. And so I wanna say thank you to uh, all of you for listening and you all for talking to us today and everybody be in touch and I will see you on the internet. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank Bye. You. Bye. <laughs>